So welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, I am Dan Barton, I'm the Wildlife Department Chair and I'm going to uh, introduce the Wildlife Eco Series and our uh, Next Generation Wildlife Eco Series. So, so this seminar series highlights the achievements and amplifies the voices of early career wildlife biologists and recognizes that this next generation of scientists is more diverse than the community of natural resource scientists as a whole. But we also recognize that systematic racism continues to impose barriers for black, indigenous, and people of color seeking careers in natural resources. This speaker series not only highlights professional achievements of black, indigenous, and people of color scientists who are role models for the next generation, but it also uh, hopes to serve as a forum to discuss how our field can move forward to reduce barriers and become a more inclusive community. The Wildlife Department uh, hopes to, to show a real commitment and to grow into an actualized commitment to challenging the status quo in the discipline and propelling a more diverse next generation of wildlife biologists. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Frank Fogarty, who's going to introduce today's speaker. Hey, thank you, Dan. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. J. Drew Lanham today. Uh, Dr. Lanham is an alumni distinguished professor and master teacher of wildlife ecology at Clemson University. Uh, he's a cultural and conservation ornithologist whose work addresses the confluence of race, place, and nature. Drew is the poet laureate of Edgefield County, South Carolina, and the author of several books, including The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature. He is a winner of the Reed Environmental Writing Award, the Southern Book Prize, and a 2017 finalist for the Burroughs Medal. The Home Place was most recently named Memoir and Scholarly Book of the Decade by Lit Hub and Chronicle of Higher Education. Drew's creative work and opinion appears in Orion, Vanity Fair, Oxford American, High Country News, Bitter Southerner, Terrain, Places Journal, Newsweek, Slate, NPR, StoryCorps, Audubon, Sierra Magazine, and the New York Times, among others. He's a contributing editor for Orion Magazine and a lifelong bird watcher and hunter conservationist living in Seneca, South Carolina. So please join me in welcoming Dr. J. Drew Lanham this afternoon. Thank you so much, Frank. And thank you, thank you, Dan, for, for having me there um, in, in Humboldt, uh, with you at Humboldt State University in Arcata. Um, I am here, obviously, in the upstate of South Carolina, um, really near the Blue Ridge Escarpment, just a, a soaring hawk's downhill glide um, from the Southern Appalachians and in, in the broken and fractured Piedmont at Clemson University. And this is an opportunity for, for us, for us, for, for those of us who think of, of ourselves as, as nature nurturers, really, um, to, to gather safely, distantly, as the science tells us. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't gather around um, common ideas. And, and conservation is, again, I think, at a, 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 an inflection point. And so I would like to, to take a little bit of time tonight to share with you some some stories really, um, some creative ideas to give us maybe some, a little bit of, of pullback to look, not just from whence we've come to where we are, to hopefully where we're going. And a large part of that doesn't just involve wildness and wild things, it involves us human beings. I'm an ornithologist, as, as Frank introduced me, and so a, a bird brain by training, but also by passion. I came to, to, to my knowing of birds early on as a boy and with this feather fascination and this fantasy of flight. But then beyond that, uh, understanding not just what birds are by, by taxonomic designation, by common name, by evolutionary lineage, but also who birds are. And as wildlife ecologists, we're always trained to, 
to avoid anthropomorphism, but I'm going to challenge you tonight to think about how we are connected. And so my assignment is for you to remember this mantra. Same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same fate. Same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same fate. We are all downstream from someone else or upstream from that next soul. So this, these connections are obvious to us, to those of us, whether here in the Southeast or in the Pacific Northwest as you are, our job, I believe, is doing the science, knowing the science, but then translating it. We ultimately demand the same things as the birds we watch. And so as our collective existences hang in the balance each day, bounded by personal and professional challenges, there are these external and internal stresses. We all watch and worry as nature is besieged, as it's marginalized and collected, coveted and cornered by a privileged few. We all watch as the survival of many of the wild things in green places seem increasingly uncertain. I ponder, I know you ponder as well, the condition of the earth and the stresses we oppose, impose upon her. And so called by something deep inside of us that's almost incalculable, that urges us to keep as much nature whole as we can, I want to take this opportunity to bring us together in this virtual environment in this socially distanced time, those of us who would call ourselves kindred, wild, and caring hearts, those of us who would call ourselves ecologically enlightened spirits, those of us who would call us wandering, wondering watchers, that there is this mission to conserve. And so it gives me a great deal of pleasure to be among you. You can see me from wherever you are, and it might be obvious or maybe not so obvious who I am by appearance. First, I'm a bird watcher. I'm a bird absorber. I watch birds with deep intent. I'm also a hunter. I'm also a gatherer. But I do all of this in black skin that many people don't frequently associate with my profession, with my avocation. So I'm hyphen hyped and ready to be a part of the movement to make nature relevant in new ways, to hack new paths through the thicket of traditional paradigm. Here I and before you, the black boy who thought he could fly grown into a black ornithologist obsessed with flying feathered things. The scientist within me urges me on to search for answers that will puzzle together the pieces that help us to conserve the whole. That includes ourselves. But now after all these years, nearly 30 years, of being the objective idea generator and data gatherer, I yearn for something more than statistical explanation for, for why a wood thrush's song here, you there, a very thrush's song might make my soul quiver. I need something more than a 300 word sanitized abstract to touch me bone deep. And I've come to the realization that as scientists, we've done a pretty, a pretty damn poor job of reaching the hearts and minds of the rest of those folks who aren't us, who don't hold advanced degrees with an ology at the end. 
So instead of embracing the wonder through the science that we practice, we often take the multidimensional array of creatures and places and interactions and boil the sweetness out of them down into the flat pages of important, critical, peer review, but obscure journals that most will never read. There is indeed data to be collected. Yes, science, robust science is the critical nexus that gathers the information that we must have to act. So make no mistake for me, there is no denying the science here. There is no question that our world is warming. Conventions of the world's best brains have told us so. We can see the evidence of it. Species are being drawn down into the vortices of extinction that spin faster in that swirl as the end of their existences are accelerated exponentially by what we build, what we frack, mine, cut, or covet in the name of capitalism and progress. There are reams of data, the numbers and statistics that are, that are there to convince anyone who would dare open their eyes and see and think. There are volumes of referee journals, the fossilized ones bound in gathering dust in library stacks and the newfangled ones staring back at us from the numbing screens on our desks and laps. This information is critical. Again, it's the basis for our actions. The data heaped upon data and squeezed through peer review. But so much of that never sees the light of inspiration. And so that's the reasoning for my reaction and, and the reason that I am here with you today. There is something missing. There is, there is something that's unmeasurable, unpublishable, incalculable, that is absent from the necessary process that we call conservation. I believe we must refine the art in conservation and refocus to doing and not just talking into our own echo chambers. After all, if an ounce of soil, a single sparrow or an acre of coast redwood forest is to remain, then we must look to the hearts of the masses to push things forward. For the sake of saving wildlife and wild places, that traction has to come not just from the regurgitation of the data that tells the bad news, but also inspiration to do better from the poets, the prophets, the preachers, the professors, and yes, believe it or not, from presidents. All of those people who dare to think, feel, and act. Eco-prophet Aldo Leopold said that our ability to perceive quality in nature begins as an art with the pretty. It expands through successive stages of the beautiful to values as yet uncaptured by language. And so I tell you today that heart and mind cannot be exclusive of one another in the fight to save anything. I believe that, that in order to, to help others understand nature, we have to make it live, make it breathe like some giant, revolving, evolving celestial being with ecosystems acting as organs and the living things within those places, us included, as cells vital to its survival. And so my hope is that we might move others to find themselves magnified through the science, through the nature, whomever and wherever that might be. That means inclusion. That means diversity. That means bringing everyone into this conservation conversation. And so our task is not just to know. Our task is also to connect. The way for us to do so lies close at hand. And so I'll tell a little story now, maybe that, that helps us understand 
the state of our past, our present, and our future. Once upon a time, the people of the First Nation saw first this land and the abundance that fed, that clothed, that housed, that inspired them. It was a land overflowing with wildness, mast and wild honey, and it was good. Not perfect, mind you, because the first people were users too, but in a different way, and it was good. But then the ships came, and what had been plentifully imperfect began to dwindle, and the good began to dwindle too. De Soto and his conquistadors began the plundering and the dwindling that would go unchecked even until now. The explorers here like Catesby Bartram, those who took Manifest Destiny West like Lewis and Clark saw the abundance and were yet amazed even in its waning and wrote about it. They sometimes struggled, in fact, for the words to describe it. Rivers choked with runs of eel and shad and salmon, skies darkened with flocks of birds that broke the branches out of enormous trees, herds of ungulates that took days to pass a single observation point, prairie dog towns, really cities that encompassed hundreds of square miles, condor soaring, ferret scurrying, Forests dark and deep with monstrous skyscraping trees with murrelets nesting in the clouds, marshes and prairies with no end. The immigrant bird artist, a neurotic bankrupt Scotsman wannabe poet named Alexander Wilson, and an arrogant, self absorbed, biracial Franco Haitian named John James Audubon painted the wonders of the waning plentiful abundance, bird by bird. Imperfect human beings, through their eyes, the world began to see at least the natural wonders of this place and that there was still good left, even as it was getting worse. So when one studies the evolution of us, of our profession, of wildlife conservation, of environmental stewardship, from the abundant plenty of the past through manifest destiny, through decades of wanton waste to spiraling rates of extinction, to some reckoning by Thoreau and Muir and George Bird Grinnell and the nameless bird-loving women who contemplated their convictions for conservation even as they demanded suffrage, on to Theodore Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot and George Washington Carver and Rosalie Edge and Aldo Leopold and Ding Darling and FDR and Sigurd Olson and Rachel Carson and E.O. Wilson and Jane Goodall, Majora Carter, Greta Thunberg, you there in Arcata and those yet to be named, yet to be born, that these Kindred spirits had a vision, some courage, a certain resolve to change things, the grit to do better, even in the worst of times where we are now, to combat the market gunners in punt boats, to stem the deadly tide of predatory plume hunters shooting long-legged waders off the nests by the millions in the name of fashion. Bison exterminated by technology? for greed and racist rationale. Rail and repeating rifle took white men west who slaughtered the herds to push Lakota, to push Crow, Assiniboine, and Blackfoot out. Carcasses littering the ground with only the tongues removed and the remainder left there to molder. The Great Plains fell silent. Empty, no chickens dancing, elk, wolves, pronghorn, grizzlies. The great Na Plains nations all in the way of westward expansion. And meanwhile, back here in my native south, land worked by enslaved was given to freedmen and then taken back. And what was left? 
was often stolen by tax lien and institutionalized trickery. And so those of us who often worked the soil and tried in vain to pay deed by sweat and toil failed. The 40 acres and the mule became promises broken just as the land taken from First Nations were promises broken. It was and now is a world built for the pleasures of some that we call national parks, that we call hunting reserves. And the wild things suffered in the privilege, killed and plundered until billions were reduced to fewer and fewer. And there were names for some because the once uncountable were down to one, Martha the passenger pigeon and Incas the Carolina parakeet, the last of their winged kind dying alone, languishing in Cincinnati zoo cages until life's last light dimmed to dark. Booming Ben, the heath hen, boomed his last on a Martha's vineyard dune and met his inglorious end in the mouth of a feral cat. Now, where have we heard that? And a she-wolf's fierce green fire faded in New Mexico because no one at the time had their heart's ears ready to hear the mountain cry for its very life in the jaws of the deer. Swamps were drained and busted, soil eroded, the droughty dust bowl erupted, the black rich Chernozum was plowed under to blow dust from Oklahoma and Kansas into the capital's chambers. Old growth was cut and devastated. The great Lord God bird, the ivory-billed woodpecker, double wrapped, knocked and Kent called in the den of ravenous saws and steam engine forestry run amuck. It soon went quiet. And in the silence of wildness and atoms splits and collides and deafens us forevermore. We are all newly threatened with oblivion. Poison and pesticides are sprayed everywhere carelessly for a better bug-free life. But it becomes death, biomagnifying death. A courageous and quiet heroine named Rachel Carson said, though, think but feel more. We try. Martin Luther King Jr. marches for equal rights. And still there is no clean water to drink in Flint. Toxic flumes choke the poor and people of color more. The Amazon burns. Plastic floats as islands to make deadly Anthropocene trash. Yes, the world is warming up. Polar bears are drowning and poor children in Appalachia cannot breathe. It is the same climate. No, coal has never been clean. And yes, all of this is happening even if some would deny that it is. And so I would argue that history isn't really past. What we knew and saw before, we see and still live now. We will see it manifest again into the future and impact those to come behind us. Even worse, if those of us in conservation, those of you working so hard for that esteemed degree from Humboldt State University, have this responsibility to do more than just know the theory. Contrary to what you might have heard, extinction is a verb. It's the final action word, really to be conjugated only once. But conservation is also an action word. To conserve is at the taproot of us. It is our function, it is our genesis, it is our goal, it is our revival. And so I'll remind you that even during the worst of times, there is good in what has gone on. I want you to weave into all of what was bad 
all of the wrongs against the wild, the right we somehow found, the Morrill Act, the Lacey Act, Pelican Island, a hunter conservationist naturalist president sitting in lame duck session and carving out swaths of national forests before a sleeping Congress could react. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act that's been gutted recently, Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Migratory Bird Hunting Act, the Duck Stamp Act, Pittman Robertson, Dingle Johnson, the Endangered Species Act, CITES, Clean Air, Clean Water Acts, the Farm Bill, the Paris Accord. I want you to think about those who would act by word, Aldo and a Sand County Almanac, Rachel and Silent Spring, Dr. Wilson and Biophilia, Jared Diamond, Gun, Germs, and Steel, Peter Matheson, Wildlife in America, the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, scrolls and etchings on hides and rocks and stories in caves and around fire circles, the sketches at Lascaux. All of it passed down for ages, telling us something. Holy words, sacred words, sketches, directives to notice, directives to care for our world, and yes, for one another. I sometimes have this crazy dream, this, this imagining that the ghosts of Rachel Carson and Martin Luther King are talking environmental justice and land health over bird-friendly coffee. Wouldn't that be something? So I want you to consider all of this, the good and the bad, imagine what it took. Then I want you to imagine harder at what it will take going forward. What was, what is, what we changed from worse to better. Consider the historical context, the historical track. How did we in fact save anything at all? It's a miracle that there is anything left really, but where are we now in the undulating sign function of discovery, of exploitation, of extinction, and recovery? That's our question. As you enter final exams, perhaps, and worry over grades, I'm going to give you the option to give us a grade. What grade would you give us on our most recent tests? to inform, to inspire, to make better from worse, to conserve. Have we advanced? Have we backslid? Or are we just barely holding ground? And so I'm, I'm gonna ask you there, what do we do now? We are tasked with a pretty heavy responsibility really to teach those of us who are faculty as students, yours to learn, but all of us are tasked with connecting and conserving. Conservation has at its core this mission, okay, get this, to love and to care. It means that what we do here, stewarding grasslands and wetlands and forests and shorelines, city parks, and greenways, sustainably managing and nurturing, conserving wildlife from white-tailed deer to black and white warblers here in the east, to humpback whales and marble murrelets there, to bull trout, to grizzly bears, to Gila monsters, and all of the other wild places and things we can possibly think of, making sure that where necessary, the human hand is minimized, but then too, understanding that reconnecting humans to nature is a necessity. Exclusion is a privilege, often a sin, sometimes a crime. Now, to be sure, our hands are already in all of this too. 
but how do we handle it gently? How do we tread more lightly? How do we invite others in who've been kept out? Yes, conservation's mission is to care. We, Frank, Daniel, and I, we have to teach that. We must all investigate it. We must all somehow enforce it. We must think it and communicate it. We must feel it, but most importantly, we must be it. Now, what does all of this mean? It means that wrapped around the responsibility that you've taken on of caring is the privilege of loving. I would ask if we truly grasp our place as part and parcel of nature, not being separate from it and, and tied that, that, that understanding that we're tied tight as ticks as members and neighbors and cohabitators standing shoulder to shoulder, even in this distance time to one another. But we're also standing shoulder to wing, to fin, to hoof, to scute, to claw. I would ask, do we have that indomitable grit and psychosociological carrying capacity to do better as we descend into some unknowable conservation burrow in this new age of hopefully recovering great againness, dismantling where so much has been dismantled, disassembled and disdained by loophole interpretation and, and simply ignoring environmental law. What's the cost being incurred for our profiteering? What will it net us in the end? Well, you are there. You are here with me tonight because I know you understand what's at stake. It's why we do what we do. Now, understand you came into this major knowing there is no get rich quick scheme in our line of work. There is only a long term, forever remembered, become enriched with each sunrise investment plan. Our stocks rise with each dawn chorus of migrating birds that fall into our birding patches. And with each Roosevelt elk's bellow echoing off the boles of mighty trees, it is amortized in each shad or eel or salmon who returns in an epic journey to spawn in a rushing natal stream where it was once an egg. Our savings are compounded with each sunset glowing red as fire on estuarine marsh, compounded with each sea turtle's eon old crawl from surf to shore. Interest accrues with every witness to the miracles of migration and adaptation and in those dividends, we cash in on treasures beyond any currency's value. It's our job to keep this value. How do we reclaim what's been lost and compound that good that's been gained? It's going to require us to not only do the best science that we can do, it's going to require us doing more than we ever have in the face of decreased funding and a culture of science denial. It will require us to do more than settle for policies that are already written. We must draft new ones. It will require a more zealous enforcement beyond slaps on the wrist for crimes against nature and humanity. It will require us to fish for hope where there is no structure and hunt for a way where there seems to be none. It will require us to not kneel on the necks of our brethren because their skin is darker. And so this will demand we stand on a bedrock of what we know is right, what we know is good that has been done to look forward but to be bold and recognize that we must build and stand on new ground. It means breaking down global convention that the scientists and professionals consume to render pieces small enough that it becomes palatable to the masses 
who vote by township and by crossroad. It means this can no longer be a closed carton of homogenized good old boy effort. There's an expiration date on that carton of demographically colored change coming due and that right soon. It's time for us to break the complacency boxes we've been comfortable in, to shatter the glass ceilings over our heads, to integrate the leadership and turn over the board tables, open up the clubs for non-restricted access and mix things the hell up. Let's inclusively maximize our own diversity, even as we so eagerly seek to do it in our field work. Now, this means that all of us, whatever degree we are attaining, whatever we seek to be, educators, ornithologists, ecologists, mammologists, herpetologists, biologists, ichthyologists, policy wonks, law enforcement, modelers, bureaucrats, all of us must become activists toward a single cause. Hunters and birders must let off the full draw and put the high-powered binoculars down to recognize common quarry. None of us are non-consumers. Whether we watch or walk or shoot or stalk, we leave trails behind us and take more from this land than we ever give back to her. And so I think this means we must see our roles and responsibilities in some new light rising. We must all recognize that the human dimension is in fact the hardest to manage or predictably model. We must realize that our fates as homo sapiens, the knowing ape and that of wild beings are inextricably linked. We are all in this together, my friends. Same air, same water, same soil, same earth, same fate. And so my challenge to you is that you begin this social movement in the mirror. That this, in fact, this social movement, as we've watched in the past months, people gather to say Black Lives Matter, but more than say Black Lives Matter, to show that Black Lives Matter. That when you look in the mirror and understanding the mattering of your own life, to understand that you as an individual are the beginning of a micro protest, a self-contained conservation movement begins with each view that you take of you. That in understanding your role, your responsibility as a nature nurturer, that you are taking on a unique responsibility that's as big as this earth that you've taken on the responsibility of getting not just your head around the ideas, but your arms around the concept and your heart all over it. So look in the mirror. As we are socially distant so far apart from one another in many ways, take this opportunity to organize yourself, your own micro protests, to understand that there is no separation between civil rights and environmental justice and conservation. They're all in the same tidal pool. That's our task to love, to care, to conserve for the wild and for one another. I'm so grateful to you for having me there with you today, even though I'm still here in South Carolina. I'm grateful to, to Dr. Fogarty for his patience and his persistence in, in asking me to come out with you. The only thing I'm going to hold your department to 
is when it is safe to do so that I'm able to come out there and, and actually walk the lovely ground of Northern California and see some of the wonders of Humboldt Bay. So I look forward to doing that. I look forward to meeting some of you and when we can do so, exchanging handshakes and hugs and looks at birds and how we all fit together. Thank you very, very much. Great, thank you so much, Drew. So we've got a little bit of time for, for questions. Uh, if folks wanna type them into the chat, they can do that. Or if you wanna use the little raise hand thing and want to, to ask with the microphone, if you could just raise your hand and I can call on you that way we don't have a bunch of people using the mics all at once. You're muted, Drew. There we are. There that, yeah. I promise you, um, I promise something that few people promise, and I live up to this 100% of the time. I guarantee a response. Sometimes it's a shoulder shrug or eyebrows raised, but you'll always get a response. So Matt, I think, is asking a question. Matt Johnson. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Drew. Great hey, talk. Matt. Really thought provoking. I'm a faculty member here in wildlife. And um, uh, HSU, um, you know, has a long tradition of natural resource management. Um, but apparently there's some conversation and we're poised to potentially be designated a polytechnic university. Um, <laughs> and, and what, you know, you were just speaking about uh, not only the, the interplay or the, the, the mutual reciprocity between social justice and conservation um, and civil rights, but also the relationship between affection and science. Yeah. Um, and none of those words it probably immediately come to the front of the tongue when someone thinks of a polytechnic university. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm wondering, um, you know, what, how do you think some of those um, emphases get baked into a curriculum? Matt, um, I've sad to say, been there, done that. And uh, I've, I've been around here at Clemson long enough to, to see it now beginning to repeat itself, um, where administrators forgot what extension was, um, forgot that we were a land grant university. And so um, people have to be reminded. And unfortunately, conservation sort of stands in this knee deep in this culture of quiet. You know, we, we tend to be the departments that are often sort of removed and on the, on the side, even physically, and people are like, so who's in that building over there? Who are those people? What do they do? And um, part of our responsibility now is, you know, and I guess TSA came with this, came up with this statement, what is it, see something, say something. Um, we, we have to become comfortable with being um, the, the, the squeaky vole, the squeaky mouse, not the squeaking wheel, um, but we, we have to work our way in tunneling underneath, coming in however we can to help uh, administrators understand our value. Um, and part of that value, for example, with, with Humboldt is to understand the incredible reputation that the school has for producing nature nurturers, those people, those folks who um, are, are out there from, um, from, from field work to, to highest levels moving conservation forward. So a, a good bit of what we deal with is a communication problem. And that communication problem is again, that we sort of shrink back to doing our work in the field. And because many of us, I mean, if I were to put up a composite Myers-Briggs there would be a big I, right? <laughs> for, for all those people who get into this business because they don't wanna deal with people. Well, I'll tell you now, we gotta stop siloing human dimensions over here. Human dimensions is a part of every aspect of wildlife conservation. I dare you to find any aspect 
for any critter that's not touched by some human influence. So understanding that and bringing the rest of, uh, of the university, the college, any institution into where we are is important. And we have, and it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing because it's not what we've done. We haven't put ourselves up on billboards. We haven't gone into the administrative buildings and said, look, we demand to be treated at least equally as the other disciplines in terms of space, consideration of funding, our students deserve it. And students, you have a responsibility to speak up for your careers. These are your lives. We can't be silent. I know that Humboldt has this history of progressive action. And so not being quiet is important. Think of yourselves as the Dawn Chorus. You gotta sing to be heard right? That advertising, you've got a bellow in the meadow <laughs> as, the, as the elk do. You've got to flash those colors as you swim upstream. So understanding who you are and what's at stake demands that we not shrink from it. I, again, I've been through this and, and constantly seeing us discounted and, 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 and sort of taken off the table because, I mean, even by the numbers in our field, if you look at what we produce with the limited funds we have, it is incredible. I mean, you can look at everything from impact factors for wildlife faculty to efficiency based upon the dollars that you earn, the publications and graduate students that you generate, the number, the FTEs that people want to count. We are doing more with less. We've done more with less in the field. And so I'm not expecting suddenly the heavens to open up and manna to drop down and us to be funded uh, by millions when we've had to deal with dimes. But certainly I'm expecting people to say, you know what? Climate change is critical. Hopefully political change has some impact on it that we aren't discounted, that we don't have to shrink. I can tell you in some of these conversations, that I've had with, with, with some former students who are federal biologists and ecologists at, at very high levels. For the last four years, people have had to shrink back from saying even certain things. So now's the time to speak up. As hopefully a new sun rises, it's time to let the chorus spring forward. So uh, Matt, I, you know, that's a long rambling answer, but I'm about on six soapboxes here because I've been through it. I, you know, when Clemson decided it wanted to become an automotive research university, and then it decided it wanted to become a biotech university, and, then, and, and now it's decided it just spent $87 million on a new business building even as it cut down oak trees, white oak trees that were almost 200 years old. And oh, what's the mitigation for that? Let's make the floors and the walls of our little mini Wall Street out of the oaks that we cut down. How manifest destiny is that? So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Dan, I saw your hand up there. I think well, I'm sorry. I thought you were done. I, I really did not want to interrupt if you were if you were continuing. Um, no, it's I need to be stopped. <laughs> oh, no worries. I it's it's I ask you this question not out of criticism of of Clemson as as an institution or as you where you work, but you acknowledge something that I think is really important that I suspect you've thought about, which is why I ask, right? Which is that you know Clemson's a land grant university, and you know, one of the legacies of land grant universities is their role in expropriating the lands of indigenous peoples here in the Western United States, including, you know, at Clemson, I think is associated with um, expropriation of lands of the Duwamish people in the Seattle area. So like Discovery Park used mm. to be owned by Clemson University and then was sold off after wow. being stolen from Native Americans. And mm. I only know that because I've been to Discovery Park, right? Right. And so, you know, how does the American Academy uh, and it's not just land grants. We're all um, complicit in this as institutions, right? And as, and as members of these institutions, how do we 
uh, include that perspective in thinking about integrating social justice into the work that we do, like in natural resources or, or other disciplines? Uh, great question, Dan. I, you know, first, um, again, I'm going to go with communication. Um, in, in order to go forward in truth, first, you got to speak it. So here, you know, Clemson University sits on the plantation, former plantation of John C. Calhoun. And so, um, and, and then its founder, uh, Pitchfork Ben Tillman, was one of the most racist governors, despots that this country has ever known. And so understanding that history, and many students don't. Um, right now we're in debate and we shouldn't be, but, but several faculty are in debate about um, bringing out the names of the enslaved to make sure that the students understood and not just enslaved, but many of our buildings were built by prison labor, black prisoners. So, you know, we can go from, from the Southeast and, and Clemson's not unique in that sort of history, the Southeast and appropriation of black labor from enslaved labor to prison labor to exclusion by the same to appropriation and genocide of First Nations and indigenous peoples um, beyond it, that first there has to be an admission of it. And, and, and so I, I think about um, reconciliation in post-apartheid South Africa. And I remember taking a group of students over there for an ornithology class. And of course, all the students that I took were white. And um, the lectures that we gave them on the way, and this was back in about 2011. Um, and so as I was talking to the students about apartheid, which was front and center when I was coming through undergrad in the mid and late 80s, most of these students had not, had not thought about it. But I talked to them about it and the importance of, of thinking not just about the birds and not just about um, these magnificent beasts that they would see on the savanna, but to think about human condition and, and what was happening. So we talked about reconciliation. We talked about those kinds of things. But I remember driving through Soweto um, with power lines barely above these, these Mercedes vehicles that we were driving and there was a young black girl on a, on a trash pile, digging through it, looking for God knows what, surrounded by vultures of several species. And I remember seeing these students never taking out their earphones, never looking up some of them. So there are these blind spots that we have as people that we also have as institutions. And institutions have to be called to task. You know, right now I'm, I'm working on a piece, writing a piece that, that dissects and deconstructs um, John James Audubon. But we know that's happened with Muir, right? You know, and you think about who Muir was, um, who Muir, and, and what that means. Um, does it mean that we forget any good that anybody ever did, even as they were despicable people? No, it doesn't mean that, but it means that we temper our deification of them, that we tell the truth about who they were, that, uh, that we tell the truth about our institutions. Then we can begin to think about changing mission statements. We can begin to think about moving forward in a new truthful light. But until then, you have institutions, Clemson included, that sort of paint over these issues. They whitewash them, literally and figuratively. But then whitewash always in the first heavy rain comes away and that undercoat is revealed. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of, one, one of the, the responsibilities I think of senior faculty um, is to speak up on those issues, uh, it is, to, is to not shrink from the hard conversations that we have to have outside of budgets and curricula to who we are as institutions. And until we do that, um, until the pain of not changing becomes greater than the pain of change, we'll remain the same. And that's why the, that's why the academy, uh, it, it bothers me, that's why the academy is one of the most stagnant places now. It's mired in tradition. Um, 
so many of our universities have become, I mean, they're profiteering. And that's laying on the backs of tuition, right? Of students. Um, it's, 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 it's stagnant salaries for graduate students. And, um, and, and, and part of what happens in our field is we continue to do more with less. And guess what that means? That means they're gonna give you even less to do more. So, uh, you know, I don't know what that strike looks like <laughs> um, from, from wildlifers, but it, it's, it's a critical thing. I've, I've, I've literally heard a funder say, well, Lanham, you know, Lanham stayed in the black with that project. It was a red cockaded woodpecker project. This, uh, this endangered species, this uh, woodpecker looks a lot like a downy that makes its cavities in living trees. And um, I was really good for working budgets for my graduate students. And I sent this graduate student to a meeting that I couldn't attend and he called me and he said, doc, he said, um, he said, I overheard them telling each other to make sure that you lowballed Lanham because he always comes in under budget. Well, that's sort of emblematic of who we are. Uh, we've been taught to be efficient. We've been taught to be quiet. That's our culture. We've got to break out of that. We've got to break out of that. So I'm encouraging you students going forward, um, whether you are going to be working with a bachelor's degree or you're coming through and going to work on advanced degrees. Um, try to make the best deal for yourself. It's hard, I know. Graduate degrees and positions are coveted. Um, out there, out West, I'm not sure you might be organized. Here in the South, graduate students aren't organized. And so you've got to force the issue. You got to force the issue. Great. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Does anyone else have any final questions for Drew? I hope my crusty old professor hasn't uh, <laughs> just like scared. <laughs> I, I'm really not, I'm really not, I'm really not bad. I don't really have a question, but I was wondering if you could do a barred owl call for us. <laughs> a barred owl call, Taylor. <clears throat> okay. Oh my God, that was so good. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe not such a great thing for spotted owls or, or, you know, I think about the construct of species and what barred owls are doing, sort of doing what they would do and what spotted owls are and that they get groovy with one another when they get together and produce viable offspring kind of calls into question that whole species thing maybe, huh? or at least biologically, right? So Taylor, can you do a can you can you do can you do a spotted owl? I've he I've heard spotted owls in where was I? I was uh, above Corvallis, Oregon. Oh well, it looks like I called for that. I did. I work as a spotted owl surveyor, and I have <laughs> had to practice my calls. They're not. They're not. Oh no, <laughs> they're not nearly as good as yours. Um, oh God. All right, I can do a four note. It's like, I'm gonna turn off my video because I'm really embarrassed now. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Lovely. I, that, that's really good. I dig that. Thank you. 
Great. But I think that's an awesome note to wrap up on with our, our barred and spotted owl calls. Dr. Landon, thanks again so much for coming out and talking to us. It was great. And I hope we can get you out here at some point to, to see all the, the amazing birds here in Humboldt County and, and talk with you in person at some point in the future. I, I look forward to it, Frank. And Dan, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you for your hospitality virtually. I feel the love. And, um, and really go forward. There's a lot of beauty in the world left for us to protect. They're all of us and the diversity of who it is that we are. So respect one another, stay safe, protest in your own way. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Drew, and, and thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Um, it's uh, a really welcome break from your, your typical uh, science seminar and, and I really appreciate it. I've been locked up staring at a computer screen for, for too long and this is the best computer screen staring I've done in a minute. So thank you. You're very welcome, Frank. I mean, Dan, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Frank.